morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you'll be joining us from all over the world. So currently we are going to have an interview with the iconic doctor Igor Linharis de Castro. He has over 20 years of experience in the pharmaceutical industry with a focus on regulatory affairs, quality and business development. His experience spans across Latin America with regional representations within health authorities like Anvisa Brazil, ISP Chile, and organizations in Mexico. He currently serves as the director, deputy country head at Bi Biocard Brazil, where he heads the regulatory and scientific operations of the Latin American region. Through this role, he focuses on regulatory affairs, pharmacoeconomics, market access, clinical research, and pharmacovigilance. He has over 14 years of volunteering experience with the International Pharmaceutical Federation, with over 12 years of experience in the Executive Committee of the Industrial Pharmacy Section. He has served as the former treasurer of the Industrial Pharmacy Section for eight years and currently serves as the secretary of the Industrial Pharmacy Section, which is a four-year term. He has been previously involved in organizing the FIP World Congress for 12 years between 2010 and 2022. He obtained his pharmaceutical science diploma with a major in industrial pharmacy from Oswaldo Cruz Faculty in Brazil. He also has an MBA in business management with an emphasis in corporate business management in 2018 and acquired his MSc in Regulatory Affairs for Drug, Biologics, and Medical Devices from the Northeastern University in 2015. So welcome, uh, Igor. We're glad to have you. Uh, it's very nice to be here at attending to this interview with you. Uh, just a small uh, correction on my resume. Uh, since October last year, uh, I'm no longer working for, to BioCAD. Uh, I moved to uh, Medipharma Group. Medipharma is a Latin American uh, group of pharmaceutical companies uh, with the companies in Brazil, uh, Colombia, Ecuador, Uruguay, uh, and headquarters in Peru and a facility in Portugal as well. And uh, I'm currently the director uh, and head of regulatory affairs for Latin America in the oncology uh, branch of the company. Okay, that's fine. Thank you so much for that update. It will be noted. So on to the interview questions. We'll be going over a couple of questions and a lot of them are aligned with the FIP development goals. And our first question is, just give us a brief walk through your path from pharmacy school to your current role that that is like as you have just described highlighting some of the defining moments for you it's uh, plus 20 years of, of a history let's see uh, i decided to do the pharmacy school um, because i was uh, intended to research um, cancer drugs cancer therapies i always believed that uh, there is a huge potential in Brazil uh, for exploring um, the biodiversity and, and make them become uh, new drugs, uh, especially for cancer. And But during college days, I realized that uh, I am not the kind of person to work inside a, a laboratory and I got ad really addicted to... Uh, more bureaucratic areas like uh, pharmacovigilance, uh, regulatory affairs, uh, and so on. And I also got involved with uh, student associations during college time. So um, I first participated in the in the student association of the of the university at the pharmacy school, and then I joined the um, regional student association of São Paulo State. Uh, during college time. And that helped me to get in contact with uh, professional associations and the leaders of these associations uh, in Brazil. Uh, 
and that was something that uh, really changed my mindset as a student. And I decided whatever the career I, I choose, I would uh, have this uh, parallel path in the associations and uh, and the contributions these associations bring to the profession and um, and the health uh, scenario in general, especially in uh, in developing countries like Brazil. Um, I started my college school in ninety nine, and it was a very exciting year in Brazil because uh, in the same year, uh, the Congress House passed the law creating the uh, agency as an independent uh, body from the from the government. And visa was created in the same year, 1999. And in the same year, uh, Brazil passed the law also creating the, uh, the regulatory pathway for generics. Uh, and that's, that changed completely the scenario uh, pharmaceutical uh, uh, companies in Brazil because uh, the introduction of generic of generics uh, decreased the prices and expanded the access and several policies came in after that and so it college time was very exciting to see all these changes in, in the country the new legislations and opened my mind to to look for a, a career where i could be involved both in the associations that were debating these um uh, these topics uh, and also in the in the profession how could I work together with these uh, and, and and put myself in this place my first job was in a compounding pharmacy in Brazil uh, as a, an internship I stand for one year uh, then I started working in the um, uh, information a drug information center uh, linked to um, uh, an, an association in Brazil called the Sobravime, uh, which is focused in the pharmacovigilance. And, and the leader, uh, one of the leaders of this association was a, a doc expert uh, helping Anvisa to review clinical data uh, of um, new registrations uh, for innovative drugs. Uh, and that was my first contact supporting him uh, my first contact with the uh, application dossiers uh, to introduce new medicines in Brazil. And when I learned about the regulatory affairs and so on. And then uh, during college time, um, I needed to choose uh, the pathway of my specialization. And I, I decided to, to take the industrial pharmacy specialization. And I started looking for a job in the industry, my first step in the industry. And this previous experience uh, also uh, helping this um, organization, uh, uh, these ad hoc uh, expert and uh, pharmacovigilance areas uh, brought me uh, the experience uh, as, a, as a first time uh, to, to have my first opportunity in the industry itself. I think uh, this is uh, this was very important moment. Uh, I got some uh, job offers and uh, to start an internship in the industry. Uh, it was around 2004 or 2005. And when I was in the last year of the university, I moved to the industry as an intern in the regulatory affairs department of uh, Biosyntetica. It's a Brazilian company. And they were one of the leaders of uh, the generics market. I was very interested on this because uh, all the new laws that I explained to you. But also um, I was looking for knowledge. More than a good salary, uh, I was looking for knowledge. And, and this company uh, used to have uh, several types of products in its portfolio. They, they used to have medical devices, uh, sanitary products, uh, generics, innovative drugs, biologics. And I said, okay, for me to get trained and, and learn uh, from good professionals, it's a good company and they have a diversity of products. Uh, for me, it will be very interesting. So I, I took this um, uh, opportunity 
um, after some intervention period, they officialized my position as a junior specialist in this company. Uh, then I really started uh, a, a solid career in the industry. Uh, a year later, this company was acquired for an even bigger Brazilian company called Ache. Uh, this laboratory, Ache, was very strong in, in prescription drugs and innovative drugs. They had a, a very robust uh, research department. And uh, after the transition of this uh, fusion of the companies, I... I was offered to uh, start leading the, um, the initial products uh, projects uh, of the company uh, in uh, exporting to Latin American uh, countries. Uh, the company already had uh, a small cell. Uh, of, it was not a department. It was just an um, embryonic cell inside the regulatory department. Uh, to try registration and licensing some products in, in Latin America. Uh, the person ahead of these uh, projects uh, got promoted and they offered me uh, her position. And I started uh, exporting and preparing dossiers to, uh, from Brazil to all countries in Latin America. Uh, and that opened a new window of opportunity because uh, it. I had to deal with peers in many countries and learn with different cultures. Uh, I was not fluent in English, neither in Spanish back then. I was still studying, so it was very challenging. Um, the funny part of it is even internet was brand new in Brazil. We didn't have social media. Uh, I was looking for training on international uh, regulatory affairs, and there were no courses available in Brazil. There were no online platforms. Uh, uh, Facebook didn't exist. And digging on the internet for information, I eventually landed to FIP page. And I decided, okay, well, why not to become a member? I can become a member uh, and try to meet peers where I can exchange uh, knowledge and information about other regulations. If after one year I didn't get any result, I dismiss my membership and live my life. But maybe I can collect some fruit from this. Um, and that was the second milestone because uh, at that year, it was uh, 20, 2010. It was uh, 2010. And a few months after I joined it as a member, uh, I received an email from YPG, ECPG was former YPG, and the Industrial Pharma Session talking about the Mike Howe Award. And I decided to apply, and I eventually was selected as the winner of the Mike Howe Award of this year, and attended to my first FIP Congress in Portugal, in Lisbon. Uh, and that was another changing moment in my career, because from that point of view, I really started a, a, a robust international career. I was uh, already involved in many countries in Latin America, but there I met my colleagues from all over the world. I met everyone from uh, young pharmacists to senior directors and presidents of several companies. Um, it brought me to learn about professional associations, not only in Brazil, but uh, in international level. Um, all the knowledge I collected uh, in the in FIP, um, I started to bring the, to Brazil and anticipate several changes that occurred, several things that Brazil was starting to regulate. Uh, I knew in advance the trends participating uh, in in the conferences abroad, and in parallel to this. I finished my language skills, uh, studies on Spanish and English. I studied my MBA and I started my master's. And, and all this uh, helped me then to get promotions uh, over the year um, until uh, I got an opportunity uh, in AstraZeneca. Uh, so I moved from this Brazilian company to AstraZeneca. Uh, afterwards, uh, I worked a little bit uh, in consultancy. I started my consultant firm. 
And uh, one of my clients uh, back then, it was 2012, was BioCAD. BioCAD, a, a Russian biotechnology company uh, with branches all over the world. They offered me to do um, uh, the startup of their laboratory in Brazil and the Latin operations as head of regulatory affairs. Then I, I stayed in this company for many, many years, um, helping them to uh, register uh, biosimilars and introduce biosimilars in, in Brazil and several com countries in Latin America. Uh, until last year, when I uh, received uh, an offer from uh, Medifarma uh, to develop their uh, oncologic portfolio and, and help them to expand their portfolio of oncologic drugs um, about uh, with generics, with uh, branded generics and biologic drugs as well. So in parallel to this, I continued my role in the FIP. Over the years, I played several roles in the industrial pharma session. I started as associate, then I became a uh, uh, a full exco member. The, after that, I assumed the, the treasury position for two terms. Then I'm I'm now the current secretary, and I'm still motivated about everything that's going on. So, sorry, I think I, I took too long, but I I tried to make the history shorter as possible. <laughs> Thank you very much. That that was a very very detailed history. And so many important milestones that I really appreciate you know, how you're able to start your first internship, prioritizing knowledge over money. I think that that is quite important. And you also, your drive to seek more knowledge led you to the FIP. And then the FIP World Congress helped you understand how international regulations work, expanded your network, and you were able to take the knowledge from the FIP back to Brazil and implemented the knowledge. That is, is quite outstanding. On to the next question. Looking back, right, what challenges did you face when transitioning from pharmacy school to your pharmacy career? And how were you able to address some of these challenges? Um, I think the biggest challenge, I think it, it wasn't only for me, and unfortunately, it's something that uh, still remains today. Industry looks for young people with experience. But if you don't give people the first opportunity, they never get the experience. So it's a bit contradictory that uh, the industry expects to that students and, and young pharmacists join for their first job experience, already experience. So that is tricky and it's challenging to everyone. Um, I will not say that it was my lucky. I think my my choices in, in, in getting involved at, in student association uh, helped me to get in contact uh, with some leaders in the industry and the, in, this, in, in this scenario. Uh, during college time, um, they when I started to do job interviews, I had uh, recommendation letters. Uh, it helped me a lot. Um, the the environment and the job description of of the role of the pharmacovigilance and regulatory affairs was not a uh, hundred percent. Uh, a blank scenario to me. I already had some understanding about what uh, what is the job, and I made it very clear in the interviews that uh, I know what the area is about, and um, I tried to demonstrate that I already know that um, this is something that I really, really wanted, uh, and that was. Uh, something that was very important. I think to me, uh, how I overcome this, first of all, uh, to uh, get in contact with professionals for as many areas as possible during college time uh, and get more prepared for the job interviews. And because 
one of the things that uh, industry is afraid of is to invest in time in giving a, a, an opportunity for a young people, a, a, a fresher professional, and training this person uh, for one year training program or, or so on. And after this, when the person is prepared to start in, uh, really bringing results to the company, uh, the person said, oh, I didn't like it, this area. Uh, thank you very much, but I will move to another oh, another area, another job, and so on. So it's a really challenging to convince the industry to give you the first opportunity. And so if you already know what the area is about and you are 100% convinced that this is the path you want, uh, I think it's easier to convince the, the interviewer to give you this opportunity. And the more experience you can collect during the uh, student time, the better, because they, uh, it's contradictory. As I said, they, they ask for experience to students. Uh, it, it's complicated. But uh, eventually, uh, participating in volunteering uh, jobs, uh, associations, whatever the experience you can collect, make it, can be the difference between you and another candidate in, in this process. So that worked for me uh, many, many years ago. I still see uh, students uh, facing the same uh, hurdles nowadays. And, and now in a, in a leadership position, uh, I, I try to look to the candidates and see how they behave uh, on, on this. Unfortunately, we, we receive uh, thousands of uh, applications and we need to have some criteria to choose. And I, I need to see that the, the person is really hungry for this opportunity and really love and have passion for this area, you know. Uh, and I think this uh, will increase my chances that the, the person uh, will remain the company for a longer time. You know, the person will be happier doing the, their job uh, the company will respond to uh, his or her expectations. Um, well, this is the the process. Okay, thank you so much. It's quite amazing that some of these challenges still persist till date, but I'm glad that you suggested very practical solutions to address them. Now, the last question is, in line with the FIP development goal five, which is focused on competency development. So what skills or knowledge are valuable to pharmacy students to help in transition from school to practice? Uh, the person should be curious. I think, uh, I, 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 let me explain that. Uh, before any role in, in pharmacy, uh, we are, scientists and and if we are not curious we will not see uh, new solutions to health problems that uh, address the world so when i uh, try to interview or, or try to hire someone nowadays i try to see how because the information is everywhere it's different when, when i started that uh, i didn't find information and I really needed to dig a lot to find where the, the information was. Uh, nowadays, it's the opposite. You have information everywhere. And, and you needed to learn uh, how to deal with this information. What are the trust, uh, the sources you can trust, uh, the references uh, that uh, applies uh, better to what you are looking for. Uh, and do this faster to bring solutions to your job. Um, what, when I look for the behavior uh, of the prof or profile of someone, I try to see if the person is curious because uh, as I said, uh, industry asks for experience, but uh, probably the person will not come with this uh, big experience. But if the person demonstrates to me that uh, it's curious in whatever the challenge I give, 
they will do whatever is necessary to find the information and find the solution, it will depend less from my mentor as a leader. Because uh, part of the job, the person is already doing, you know. Uh, I cannot study for someone. I cannot uh, dig for information. I can monitor, show the pathway, but all the efforts uh, the individual should do. And uh, if the person demonstrates to me that uh, it's curious and it's motivated uh, to do whatever he do, um, I think it's part of the 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 result is already done. You know, um, as a, a high level leader, um, I need to travel many many times, and this means that uh, I need to trust in my team. Whatever I'm not physically uh, or talking to the people every day, I need to assure that the projects are going on and people are uh, looking for the results. This means that uh, not everyone have the knowledge, not everyone has the solution, but they 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 know how to communicate with the colleagues. If the colleague doesn't have the information, they will look for some 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 place. Uh, in the internet or, or a training course and whatever is needed to find the solution to the group. Um, parallel to this, teamwork. Teamwork is mandatory nowadays. It's impossible. We, we have a connectivity. Uh, people don't need to shake hands physically, but uh, let's see us. We, we are uh, different continents, uh, you know, uh, here in this call. And people from all over the world probably watching us at this moment. Uh, it never happened before in the history. So uh, we need to know how to deal with all of this. You know? So I would say uh, motivation, teamwork, um, curiosity, uh, are capabilities that to me is crucial to be successful nowadays. Very, very important points. Thank you so much, Inko, for that. And the next question is also aligning with the development goal nine, which is continuous professional development. And it's looking back into your early career, what steps or strategies did you take to continue learning and growing as a pharmacist? And what are some of the current continuous professional development programs that you recommend to early career pharmacists and pharmacists to scientists? Well, I think there is no uh, secret uh, receipt for this. You know, uh, th there is no magic. There is no rule that applies to everyone. Uh, let us share what worked for me. Um, as I decided to start a, a career in regulatory affairs, uh, I soon realized it because even in Brazil, as I said, legislations were changing and being updated all the time. So it's uh, almost impossible to rely 100% in your uh, trainings and, and, uh, and official uh, education, you know. The, the, so I did the pharmacy school. I started to deal with international projects. So I noticed that uh, I would have more opportunities and uh, have um, a better performance if I learned the languages. So I was uh, dealing with people in FIP. So if I develop my English skills, it would help me a lot to understand more the information that were be delivered to me um, in, during the congresses, during the meetings in FIP and the, the IPS meetings as well, and communicate with my colleagues. Uh, helping the companies to license from Brazil to Latin American countries, Brazil is the only country in the continent that uh, talks Portuguese. All the other countries talk Spanish. So it, it was easy to realize that uh, I couldn't expect that all the countries would learn Portuguese. If I needed to do my job, I needed to learn Spanish. And, and I started investing in the language skills, uh, getting more responsibilities, 
that led me to pursue an MBA course more than a, a technical specialization in any pharmaceutical area because I started to lead some teams already. So the administration uh, helped me uh, on this. Um, leading the, the regulatory uh, teams uh, pursuing international registrations, the company has huge expectations uh, from the commercial side, okay? When the products will be approved, so we can start in making business uh, to other uh, countries. Uh, as pharmacists, uh, my mindset was uh, when I could uh, bring my uh, my drug available to patients in new countries. But the other side of the, the pharmaceutical professional is that the companies exist. They help to bring medicines and increase access, but they always look for some profit on this as well. And this is their reality. And I needed to balance that uh, I could help patients, but I also needed uh, to help these uh, business areas in the company uh, to achieve their results. So doing an MBA course helped me to understand the mindset of the people in the other area of the company. So instead of being a regulatory professional that always says, no, no, you cannot promote the drugs like this. No, you cannot uh, sell the drug like this. I started to understand what are their concerns and propose them solutions that attend both the legislation, both the, uh, the interest of the patients and the health professionals, but also uh, their commercial interests. And it helped me uh, to, to deal better with all these different interests that uh, has in the industry. So when I finished uh, college, I was uh, in this dilemma. I think everyone knows, should I do a master's and, and, uh, and a PhD or should I do some more practical training? I choose the, the second path. I started doing several small courses about specific topics, topics that could help me uh, to perform better in my current uh, life. So I started to do workshops and small courses about the legislation of each country that um, that I, I was started working with. I did the language courses. I, I And when I, I choose a post-graduation, I choose the MBA first. Um, that worked for me. I got uh, evolution in my career. Uh, and then I realized that I really needed more uh, robust training uh, that when I decided to do my master's in the U.S. in regulatory affairs at Northeastern. And over there, I, I got in deep contact with the technical knowledge about uh, clinical research, about quality, about the pharmacovigilance and so on. And then I started doing the opposite. I started to go to the areas, the technical areas in the company and, and help them to improve their processes to meet the international standards. So if you want to export to Mexico, you need to make a better documentation like this, this, and this. Um, back that time, uh, the ICH um, legislations were not uh, widely implemented in Latin America, not either in Brazil. Uh, PICS uh, for uh, quality and GMP inspections were not uh, very implemented in Latin America. So bringing this knowledge uh, from international uh, places helped me to make my, my job better. So to me, uh, it worked. Uh, it, it is still on my plan to have a PhD. This is something that I really, really want uh, to, to accomplish in my life. But uh, to bring me to the place I am re here right now, doing small trainings uh, worked better for me. But as I said, it's not a rule that works for everyone. Perhaps someone in the quality control department or some clinical research area uh, to do a PhD first 
may may bring a much better uh, uh, training uh, to their uh, to their areas, but that is nothing that fits for all. That that was my case. You mentioned the rapidly changing environment which is quite important with a lot of internationalizations and globalization of the supply chain and also for medicines production. It's quite important to always go to workshops, take courses, attend seminars to upgrade one's skill and experience. Um, so thank you very much. And the next question is related to a point that you have mentioned, which is the constantly evolving trends in the pharmaceutical industry. So like, what are some of the key lessons you learned in your early career that helped you navigate these trends, especially with the advancement in technology and medications? I think uh, you've answered some of that already, but is there any other thing you like to add to that, sir? Yeah, um, yeah, as you said, I, I more or less covered this topic in my previous uh, responses. But uh, one of the things that we do in IPS together with uh, the headquarters of FIP is always to look ahead um, and try to anticipate the trends of the, the, the years that are coming. And as I said, during my career to participate in FIP and international projects helped me a lot to anticipate the trends. So many companies in Brazil were struggled when Anvisa created a new legislation make, with higher standards, uh, trying to harmonize Brazilian legislation with uh, regulated countries. Um, the Brazilian companies had to, to, to address that, doing investment, training people, and it was a responsive uh, approach to the new legislations and the new standards. Instead of that, uh, when whenever I started participation uh, abroad, I started when Anvisa is starting debating some topic that in a couple of years would become a legislation. I said I always said to my employers, uh, it's better for you to start planning right now because. This is an international trend, and that will happen. Um, when the company start preparing in advance, that becomes became a uh, uh, competitive uh, advantage to the company because when the new law in Brazil passed, the company was already ready to address that. Um, most of the times, that represented medicines with better quality with a more robust dossiers, with more robust processes and so on. And uh, the, the company is recognized for these high level standards. So we do this in IPS now. Um, the pandemic brought us several learnings uh, that the concentration of the supply chain in specific places uh, led to uh, shortages about uh, healthcare inputs everywhere, not only in the healthcare uh, area, but uh, you see this with uh, chips, with technology, all kinds of technologies. Um, and this is one of the trends. We in FIP are, are trying to anticipate these this trends all the time. Uh, and we can do this extrapolation to our professional careers. Oh, if we are always look ahead and see the trends, what can I do today to get prepared for this trend? So I think it's an exercise that everyone can do. This is particularly important, especially with the advent of artificial intelligence and other technological advancements in pharmacy. So we just try to make predictions, look ahead and see how we could plan appropriately. Okay, thank you so much. So the next question is about a mentor or preceptor that helped ease your transition into professional practice and how did their guidance impact on you? Um, 
Well, I ha I I'm very lucky to say that they have uh, very good and amazing professionals uh, mentoring me over the years. It was not official mentoring, but uh, people that I met over my career that became my friends and and mentoring and mentors during this time. Um, I when I started the career in a compounding pharmacy. Uh, the owner of this pharmacy was a pharmacist, a very senior and, and lovely uh, uh, pharmacist um, that uh, created the Brazilian uh, Museum of Pharmacy. And he was very uh, passionate, passionate uh, for the profession. So... Uh, Dr. Marquez, uh, and he uh, helped me to develop this passion for our profession. So that was the first mentoring that uh, helped me to get in, uh, interested in the associations, in all kinds of participation and vo volunteering and so on. Um, then I have a second mentor in the Drug Information Center, which was uh dr rubens and dr ruben helped me to um understand that um i could play a, a role w whenever i do he encouraged me to apply for a um a job opportunity in who back then uh, but i didn't have the the, the curriculum robust enough it, it's interesting story um he encouraged me uh, he printed the the job description of a role in WHO and see Igor put this in the in the war room and every day you will look at this and see the gaps in your curriculum to be in WHO and I started doing a lot of these uh, things. I needed to, to have a master's. I needed to have more languages. I needed to have uh, several trainees. And it was kind of checklist. And I started doing one by one. Uh, eventually, uh, my career didn't le uh, led me to WHO, but all the knowledge and all the skills I developed over the year opened so many doors to be in the industry uh, and, and helped me to, to achieve. So it was a very clever advice that I still apply uh, nowadays in, in several things in my life. Uh, and then in the industry, I had other leaders, many of the people who'd, um, who I would not say boss, I would say leaders, uh, because they really helped me to develop my career, sharing knowledge, uh, telling me uh, the path, the trainings, uh, how to deal with different cultures, how uh, not only uh, cultures uh, between different uh, countries, but uh, cultures inside the companies, uh, the culture in the regulatory department versus the culture in the marketing and business areas versus pharmacovigilance versus the research. Uh, and these understanding and mentoring helped me a lot. And eventually when I started uh, becoming uh, manager, I had other people, and still nowadays I have colleagues that share their knowledges and they have more senior experience uh, in leadership. And we will never learn everything, so there is always a space to to keep learning and developing ourselves. So that that is important. I think uh, first of all we need to be open to understand their device, to understand the critics and to convert these in, in a better uh, behavior or a better performance. And if we are open, there will always be someone next to you that uh, is willing to share or is open to support. I think this is important. Communication has two ways, you know, someone needs to share, but you need to be open to 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 understand and incorporate all the devices as well. One of the things I will do after this meeting is I'll print out the job description for the next tool I want to take up and <laughs> possibly I'll use that as a checklist. That's that's a very smart one and 
it's what I'm going to do. And thank you very much for that. And you also mentioned uh, the willingness to listen. That is also quite important because what has been said must also be taken into consideration. You go, uh, as a senior manager, currently you interact with quite a number of early career pharmacies, possibly described some of your interactions in the employment process. But what are some of the biggest hurdles you see that young pharmacists today are facing? And what are some of the possible solutions to these challenges? Um, I think one of the biggest challenges pharmacists have is to wear the, the shoes of other areas in the industry. Because the industries that are, are huge organizations, it's, a, it's like a living body. So uh, sometimes we are very connected to our uh, specific job or specific task that we don't understand the needs and the hurdles of the people in, of the other departments next to us. So once we start to understand uh, the needs and the challenges of people around you, uh, this distinguish the, the conflicts uh, in, in a lot and, and help us to cooperate more, to do uh, better jobs in, in teamwork and so on. Uh, as pharmacy, it was really, really challenging uh, in the beginning uh, because, as I said, we always uh, look at uh, the new legislations and say, oh, the, the agency is asking the companies to do this. Please do. Instead of just giving orders and saying yes or no, uh, okay, uh, what are the needs? Because uh, the person needs her job like me, need mine. So we need to co communicate, we need to cooperate. Okay, what do you need? This is the new legislation. How can you do this? How can I help you to do this, to change the way you are doing things, to comply with the, the new legislation? but also to keep it performing, keep it doing your job properly. And when we go outside our boxes as, as technicians and expand uh, our mindset to understand the others, uh, it helps a lot. It was really challenging in the beginning, but once I understood how to do it and uh, the trainings I got over the years, uh, working together with leaders of other areas and the MBA also uh, helping me a lot to overcome these challenges. Yes. It's important to look through the lens of other people, to try to put yourself in their shoes, be empathic, see things from their perspective and also be, be adaptable to changing trends, which is quite similar to some of the points you have mentioned before. So thank you very much for your time. Just one last question. What do you think is like the role of artificial intelligence in the pharmaceutical industry? Um, I would say that I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, let's see if our responses <laughs> uh, are still accurate in a couple of years. Um, let's say, uh, a couple of years ago, before the pandemic, uh, I joined uh, a training event uh, and the, person, the speaker was doing a lecture about the artificial intelligence. And I remember that uh, there were like a hundred uh, pharmacists, most of them from regulatory affairs. And everyone over there said, this speaker is saying that the career in regulatory affairs will not exist in 10 years. The, the computers would build the dossiers by themselves and no one will need a regulatory person anymore. And years passed, uh, more than ever, the companies need regulatory people. So I would say that um, technology and artificial intelligence is just another technology. It's coming to change life and to change the ways we do things. But there will always a need to have uh, humans leading processes 
and, and driving the changes. So we will need to adapt ourselves. It will be a different role. It will be a different way of, of working. Maybe in my area, people will not be building dossiers anymore, like printing documents and putting these. Nowadays, we don't print anymore. We, we build PDF files. Uh, and maybe uh, computers are starting to do this using artificial intelligence. But uh, computers need the sources. The documents are created by people in the laboratories doing stability uh, tests, doing quality control tests, and generating their raw data. And someone needs to teach them how to do this, complying with the standards. You know? So the role of the regulatory professional will change for more strategic role to more leadership and training role instead of putting the hands in the documents and building these and delivering things to the agencies. So more than just building the dossiers, we will need to communicate with the agencies, understand the impact of the changes to the companies and teach the other areas and lead them to, to the new scenario. So I think uh, artificial intelligence is challenging, uh, brings some sensation of fear uh, to some people, but we need to be optimists and see how can work better and uh, and how we can adapt it ourselves to this outcome. Because uh, in parallel to this, uh, we need to see the benefits. Um, we used to spend like 10 to 12 years on research before bringing a product to the market. And artificial intelligence can help us to reduce the time on research to find the best drug candidate to a specific target. Uh, we can do more treatments available in a shorter time. So uh, it, it is as it is. We need to <clears throat> anticipate the trend and try to see what skills and capabilities will be needed in few years to handle uh, artificial intelligence. Because I think it, it's a no way back. It's already knocking the doors of everyone. It's a matter of time. Uh, and the, the earlier we can be prepared for this, the better. Thank you so much for your time, Igor. Uh, with this, we have come to the end of the interview. Thank you so much once again. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much for, for uh, inviting me to this. It's always a pleasure. And in the name of the Industrial Pharmacy Session, um, I can share the, the, our thoughts and our feelings that... Uh, session is really keen to help all the students and young professionals to uh, to develop and whatever the, the help you need not only with more interviews but any other project that you develop please come to us we'll be glad to help